years, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, this is the first time I've ever been in this building, and uh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful building. I've driven past it probably hundreds of times. And I'm honored to be invited by the historical site. I see many familiar faces here. Um, I'm a geologist. I work for the Virginia Department of Mines, Minerals, and Energy. That's a mouthful. Uh, we're a state agency that does a lot of different things. Um, probably our main business is to, um, how should we say, assist the mining community. And we assist them by um, assisting them in complying with government regulations. So uh, I, I, it wouldn't be inaccurate for me to say that a lot of our activities involve with, are involved with regulating the mining industry. My particular division is the Division of Mineral Resources. So we are the geology people of the state. We used to be called the State Geological Survey. And a lot of people don't know what geologists do. We, we make maps. We're the agency that has traditionally made topographic maps, you know, these rectangular maps that you use for fishing and hunting and hiking. Uh, but we also study minerals and mineral deposits in the state in, a, in an effort to promote their development, but to promote their development in a wise manner. Um, so uh, we also have another division, uh, the Division of Energy, that is concerned with um, energy conservation in state office buildings and uh, new sources of energy that may be available within Virginia wind power, solar power. Uh, we are also involved very much in the mine reclamation business. We administer several federal programs that are actually funded by the mining industry for re reclaiming mined lands. In other words, lands that have been long abandoned. Uh, we actually bring in bulldozers and clean them up and plant grass and trees and things and return them to a somewhat natural state. So the Department of Mines, Minerals, and Energy does many things. My particular division is a little bit more involved in research and uh, mostly what we do is make maps. Maps that uh, have very specific themes and, and I'll show you some of those maps tonight. So I have a few slides to show here and then um, we'll hold up some maps and speak from even my slides are maps actually. So um, you'll recognize the general outline of this as being the state of Virginia but it's not it's probably not a map like any of you have ever seen before. Sure it's, it's the outlines of the state of Virginia but what you see on here are not counties or highways or rivers or roads what we call, these are what we call different geologic provinces of Virginia. We've, we've actually gone out and studied the bedrock of Virginia. So most of what we're walking around out here, what we're walking on is soil, some kind of soil layer. But beneath the soil, uh, and the soil layer might be anywhere from a couple of inches to maybe 30 or 40 feet thick, but beneath that there's rock, solid rock. It's still attached to the earth. It's what we call bedrock. And this is what we as geologists are very interested in. This is where the mineral deposits lie. This is where most of our groundwater is, is stored in fractures in the bedrock. So we've gone out and we've studied the bedrock all over the state, and we've recognized that the rocks of the state fall naturally into certain well-defined zones. And that's what we show here on this map. Um, beginning in the western part of the state, I'm sorry, the colors are kind of close, but there's this blue area out here. This is what we call the Appalachian Plateaus <coughs> over here. This would be, uh, say, Tazewell County and Buchanan and Dickinson, Wise County, Lee County, the extreme far southwestern part of the state. This is where most of Virginia's coal and natural gas resources are found. Um, there's very active, a lot of people don't realize it, but there's a lot of gas, natural gas drilling occurring in Virginia right now, even as we speak. There are thousands and thousands, something on the order of 3,900 gas wells in this part of Virginia down here. Uh, there are also many, many coal mines down there. Many of them are abandoned, but a certain number of them are still active. And sometimes you can even see the coal trains as they make their way from uh, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Western Virginia out across the Piedmont area. They're coming down the James River on the CSX or right through Farmville on the Norfolk Southern. So the mineral industry of southwestern Virginia has an impact all over the state. Uh, all that coal comes down here to Hampton Roads and goes out in these huge ships. A lot of it goes overseas. Okay, now this green belt here, this is the area that's west of the Blue Ridge Mountains. This is what we call the Valley and Ridge 
province of Virginia. Um, the Shenandoah Valley is part of that province, and then all those mountains to the west of the Shenandoah Valley. So let's see, Winchester would be up here, uh, Harrisonburg, Stanton, Roanoke, Pulaski, Whitfield, Bristol, like that, just to give you an idea of where this line runs. Uh, this area is known, aside, for, aside from its uh, agriculture, it's known for uh, limestone and sandstone. A lot of mineral resources come out of that area. Agricultural lime, lime used in the manufacture of cement, comes from uh, this area over here. Okay, and this sort of pink belt running down the middle here, now I don't know why I colored this pink, because these are Blue Ridge Mountains here. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the, the mountains themselves, what we think of as the Blue Ridge Mountains, really form a fairly narrow belt running uh, along this green-pink border here, but we geologists recognize uh, that the geologic Blue Ridge is actually much wider than the mountain belt itself and extends all the way out here to um, Charlottesville and Scottsville and Lynchburg and, uh, well, there's almost nothing down here, but um, <laughs> this whole area is the Blue Ridge Mountains. And the Blue Ridge Mountains, the mineral resources in the Blue Ridge are known, are, uh, would be soapstone, granite, um, a lot of crushed stone comes out of the rocks of the Blue Ridge. And then this, this yellow area here is known as the Western Piedmont. So actually this whole triangle here is the Piedmont of Virginia. This is the edge of the coastal plain. And you see we geologists have the Piedmont divided up into one, two, three, four major belts along with these other sort of green slivers in here. I'll tell you a little bit about each one of those. Um, but let me start first with talking about the Western Piedmont here. The Western Piedmont is um, an area of really infertile soil. And you'll find that out here in this area you have some very nice farms with big fat cows, and over in this area you have some nice farms with big fat cows, but over here you don't see too much. And it has all to do with the geology of the bedrock. Uh, this is mostly forest land in this whole belt here. It has everything to do with the geology of the bedrock. It just happens to form poor soils because of the chemical nature of the rocks. Um, but there's something very interesting about this line right here. This is called the, in this area, it's called the Mountain Run Fault Zone. So there's actually a fault, a break in the Earth's crust that runs right along here. And this forms the eastern boundary of the ancient North American continent. So at one time, everything west of here was North America, and everything east of here is something else. It's been added on to the edge of the continent since, let's say, a half a billion years or so, in the last half a billion years. Um, this pinkish belt running out in the middle of the Piedmont here is what we call the Virginia Volcanic Plutonic Belt. This is literally a belt of volcanic rocks that run out here. And it's thought that this is, um, you might think of it as a smashed together piece of continent that's made up of volcanic islands. So you think of um, the eastern edge, edge of Asia now, where you have uh, Japan and the Philippines, all these volcanic island chains. Sometime in the last half a billion years, the eastern edge of North America looked like that. We didn't have uh, a sandy shoreline as we have here now where you could look out across the ocean. You probably at one time could stand on a very rocky shoreline here, look across a narrow ocean basin, and see a whole string of volcanic islands off of the coast. <clears throat> and those, that whole belt has been later pressed against the edge of the continent. Now, I might be boggling your mind here, but um, we've really come to, to learn a lot more about Virginia in the last 30 years, especially with the full-scale acceptance of the notion of plate tectonics, the idea that the continents are not really stable, but they actually move around on the surface of the Earth. And the continents are moving as we speak at a measurable rate. The, um, North America is separating from Europe at a couple inches per year. It's, it's a measurable amount of distance. It's not just creeping along. It's uh, roughly the rate that your fingernails grow. That sounds kind of creeping, but it's pretty fast geologically. So um, 
At some point in the, the past, this whole belt of volcanic islands was added on to the eastern edge of North America. And then we get kind of this brown area here. This is what we call the Carolina Slate Belt that was named down here in North Carolina where it produces um, slate, roofing slate, much like we have up in Buckingham County, but uh, of a different origin. This is yet another volcanic island belt that sits out here in the middle of our people. Okay, and then this um, salmon color area here is what we call the Goochland terrain, named after Goochland County. Some call it the extreme eastern Piedmont. The rocks in this belt are very similar to the Blue Ridge Mountains, and we think this is a piece of the ancient North American continent that was actually uh, stood out here as a microcontinent, a very small continent, off the eastern edge of North America, and was later added. So, um, I'm kind of waving my arms here and talking about the continents moving and adding things on, but this is just the preamble to what my talk is really about tonight, and that is the geology and mineral resources of the Farmville area. Uh, this yellow area here is um, the coastal plain. So these, this is, these are sedimentary deposits that were laid down by the current Atlantic Ocean. I say the present Atlantic Ocean, implying that there were other Atlantic Oceans before this one, and that is, in fact, true. Um, but the present Atlantic Ocean, at one time, lapped all the way up here, actually quite a bit beyond Richmond, and all of these uh, layers out here were deposited on the floor of that ocean. We just happen to be lucky that uh, the sea level is pretty low right now, and the shoreline happens to be out here, but I can assure you that the sea level is rising, and at some time in the next three or four million years, I would say, uh, we're gonna have shorefront property over here in the Richmond area. <laughs> so what about Farmville? Um, I mentioned the, the mountain run fault before, and it turns out that all of these pieces of the Piedmont are divided by major fault zones. In other words, major fractures in the Earth's crust, major breaks in the Earth's crust that separate these different geologic terrains. And Farmville sits right here, right at the boundary between two of these terrains, between the Central Virginia Volcanic Belt on the west and the Carolina Slate Belt on the east. And this thing right here is probably the biggest fault zone in the whole state of Virginia. And it runs right through Farmville. Now, why don't we ever feel any earthquakes? Well, the truth about it is, we do. We do feel earthquakes here. We don't get anything like the earthquakes they get in California because we have a relatively quiet continental margin. The, the eastern margin of North America is experiencing a period of relative quiet. It hasn't always been that way. When these island masses docked with North America, there was a lot of upheaval, lots and lots of earthquakes, lots of volcanism. Virginia looked very much different back then than it does now. But all of that quieted down, and now we've got a very nice, what we call a passive continental margin. So the, the different pieces of Virginia are settling very slightly, but nothing like in California where the pieces are actually moving like this every day. So here we just get these really gentle earthquakes that once in a while will knock a lamp down or rattle some dishes, but um, not too much damage. So, um, one thing I didn't mention were these green areas here. And these green areas here, so let me just say, the, all these rocks of the Piedmont are metamorphic rocks. These are all rocks that were buried deeply under an ancient mountain belt and were metamorphosed. That is, they were baked, cooked, recrystallized. Uh, we see the highest mountains of Virginia are in the Blue Ridge here and down here in Mount Rogers in this part of the Blue Ridge. But at one time, the highest part of the Appalachian Mountains was out here over Richmond, believe it or not. So all of this area of Piedmont was at one time buried beneath a very high mountain belt. 
And when rocks are pressed deep beneath the earth there, they become heated and they become, they get cooked into something other than they, they were originally. So all of these are metamorphic rocks, except these little green areas here. There's a whole string of the Marine Gamma's fault zone here. And here's one in the Richmond area, and then this great big one up here. This is called the Culpeper Basin, the Richmond Basin, it's Ellersville Basin. This one right here is called the Farmville Basin. It's of Mesozoic age. This, these basins formed literally during the time of the dinosaurs. These basins are younger than all the surrounding rocks. So it's actually a little down warp in the Earth's crust that was filled with water at one time and then filled with sediments. It filled with uh, lake deposits, filled with coal, filled with sand, filled with gravel. And that is um, what formed these, these basins out here in the Piedmont. And it's, those basins have had a huge impact on the kind of minerals available um, in this part of Virginia. So let me, um, I'm going to say a lot more about that in a little bit. Let me, let me move on to the next slide here. Um, this looks like a bowl of spaghetti, but <laughs> this, is, this is a close-up of the geologic map of Virginia. Uh, showing the Farmville Prince Edward area. So here's the Appomattox River coming down like this. Uh, basically, the boundaries of Prince Edward County are here. Okay, and I'm going to ask you to try to ignore most of the details on this map. Just think of this, all this out here is the Carolina Slate Belt. And these are just different kinds of rock types in the Slate Belt. This big thing here is called the Burkeville Granite. And this is where the the big Lux stone quarry is uh, over in Burkeville is in this big granite out here. Um, this is the Central Virginia Volcanic Plutonic Belt. And then this is this Mesozoic Basin that exists mostly um, across the river, but the town, a good part of the town of Farmville sits right on that basin. Here's the Appomattox River, here's the town of Farmville right here in northern Prince Edward County. And um, here is this big fault zone that runs right through town like that. Actually, there's another one that wraps around this way. Did anyone know we had a fault running right through Farmville? Mm -hmm. Carolyn's really smart back there. <laughs> um, so I don't mean to frighten anyone, but this is a major boundary in the North American crust here, and we recognize it as such. Uh, so, and then there's this other little basin here called the Briary Creek Basin. Most of this was flooded when they built the reservoir down there, but I have had some interesting things to say about that in a little bit. Okay, this is a different map of the same area. This is called the Mineral Resources Map of Virginia, and it just shows the different mineral resources. In other words, the valuable materials that we find in the earth over different parts of the state. Um, here's this Farmville, Mesozoic Basin. Here's the town of Farmville right here. And these red areas are areas of coal deposits. Um, these pinkish purple things up here are the kyanite deposits. Here is Baker Mountain over here. Here's one of the uh, bagging plant, the kyanite bagging plant on the railroad over at Pamplin. Um, this is the Briary Creek Basin, and it's not shown as pink, but there's actually some small coal deposits in the Briary Creek Basin. And then most of this green and white stuff out here uh, is an old interpretation of the granites. Uh, this sort of stippled area here is an area of mica and feldspar mineralization. I'll be talking about that a little bit more in a minute. And then the gold belt. Everyone's interested in gold and the gold mines. Uh, the gold belt is actually this shaded area up here. It runs, it actually does extend a little bit into Appomattox County. I'm going to show you in a minute. In a minute, there is actually a gold um, prospect here near the town of Prospect. But the gold belt basically ends about here and runs all the way up to Fairfax County, with the richest deposits being in Buckingham, Louisa, Goochland. Um, I've already said an awful lot. Does, does anyone have any questions before I go any farther? Okay. 
So I know you people are interested in the history of the area, so I'm, I'm going to say a little bit more about um, the history of mining in this area. Let me just take a quick look here. Okay, this is kind of interesting. Let me lower this down. Um, it turns out, is anyone here on the staff of the Farmville Herald? <laughs> What do you know about the early days of the Farmville Herald? Farmville Herald was established by the Farmville Coal and Iron Company in exactly. 1890 to uh, promote economic development in this area, particularly for the coal mines and iron pits across the river, Lithia Springs, etc. Okay, so our resident, resident expert Bob Flippen back here, and uh, I agree with everything he said. Um, the Farmville Herald, Herald was really begun as a vehicle for the Farmville Coal and Iron Company to sell stock and um, promote economic development in the town of Farmville. So they were, here they are in about 1890 advertising a million dollars worth of capital stock. They're trying to raise money to turn Farmville into the next Birmingham. They thought, well, we've got coal here. Someone, I don't know who, identified these iron deposits and convinced a whole bunch of people that this was a very iron-rich area, a very coal-rich area. They sold an awful lot of stock, and then as far as I can tell, the company never really did much of anything. <laughs> they spent a lot of people's money and never really made it. And that's probably, it turns out there is a fair bit of coal here, but the iron really didn't pan out. Um, there are some iron-bearing rocks around here, but they were nothing near like the very rich iron deposits in the Pittsburgh area or out in Minnesota or even down in Alabama. So, um, about 1890, this was going on. Also around that time, a, a little bit after the turn of the century, there was another company in here called Tidewater Oil and Gas. Bob, you know anything about Tidewater? Oh, very little, but um, I know that they were selling shares of stock for a dollar a share. They were all over this area, and uh, Dunnington bought about 100 shares of them. And I got a letter from them to Dunnington tell them about all this drilling that they've done and, uh, and the Jor mine and over by Fork, Fork Well near Fork Swamp in Cumberland County mm -hmm. and how they were uh, running into the, the deepest, luscious looking chocolate shale mm -hmm. and that it, um, the promises were good, they were down 800 feet, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Just send us more money, please, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so th these guys kind of did the same thing. And this was, I think, around 1910 or so. Um, these guys did the same thing. They came in here and they said, well, there are very, very rich natural gas deposits underneath the Farmville area. And in fact, they did drill one well up um, in Fork Swamp up there. And I, I can show you on a map where that is. But it was northeast here, about halfway between here and Cumberland. And I forget how deep they went. They went over a thousand feet. They had one little bubble of gas in the well, and that was it. So, um, <coughs> Beware of big promises when it comes to, to um, minerals. So I, in a few minutes I'm going to say a little bit more about the, the history of mining, but um, let's say that coal as a mineral resource in the Farmville area uh, never really made much money for people. There is coal here, but most of the coal was just dug out by the wagon full basically for, for heating people's houses. But back in the 1950s, someone thought, all right, I'm going to make a lot of money on coal. So they went up to these mines that are northeast of town here, and they got a water pump, and they pumped. The, the mines naturally fill up with water when they're abandoned. And they pumped all the water out of these mines, and they went down there, and they saw some actually nice thick coal seams. But apparently they weren't able to raise the capital to develop it, and the project was abandoned. But we have this one picture of this kid standing next to this water pump down in one of these mines. This was in the early 1950s. Does anyone recognize this person? This person right now would probably be in his 60s, I guess. It's uh, the late Jack Stewart. Oh, really? Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's, um, Jack. Yeah. Jack Stewart. Jerry Stewart's brother. Jerry runs Four okay, Street. Mead Stewart's son. Uh, that's interesting. We didn't know who this was. Yeah, that's who this that's amazing, thank you. <laughs> but as far as we know, this, this was the last um, effort to do anything commercial with the coal deposits around here. But there's still coal on the ground here, 
in the Farmville Basin and the Briary Basin. And I'm going to say just a little bit more about that in a minute. But um, it, it, no one's just ever really gone after it with the right capital. And I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to take your money like that. <laughs> Someone may it. Um, that's about it for my pictures. I have a few maps I wanted to show you. First of all, did everyone get a handout? I, I violated a fundamental um, tenet of lecturing, and that is getting everyone their handouts first. David, what, what year was the gas company act? It was very early in the 20th century. Very early. I think that well was drilled in 1911. It's very early. So 20 years of it. Exactly. But I'm going to show you a map now that um, suggests that the real heyday of this area, at least of the of mineral exploitation, was in the 1830s and 40s. This one on top there, too. Oh, it's upside down. Okay. What I do Finally, I found my call. <laughs> um, we can lay this out on the table and you can look at it afterwards, but um, this is the outlines of Prince Edward County here. Uh, this is these bluish areas are these Mesozoic sedimentary basins that sit in the Piedmont that hold coal and a little bit of natural gas and a little bit of iron, not very much. Um, but let me see. As far as we know, the earliest coal mining in this area was down here. Uh, this is now underneath Briary Creek Lake. But this was called the Flournoy Mine, and it was active from the 1830s up until the 1880s. And they pulled a fair bit of coal out there. We don't really know exactly how much, but we think it was mostly used for heating people's houses. It wasn't a huge industrial operation. The same thing here. There was some guy named Venable who... <laughs> heard of that guy before? <laughs> who had a mine here at the north end of the Briar Basin in the 1880s. And that apparently was active for just a few years. And uh, my colleagues who know where this is say you can still go there and see this hole in the ground. And it's behind someone's chicken house. That's all they tell me. It's behind someone's chicken house. Slave Hill. That's probably Slave Hill. Yeah. And there are uh, piles of dirt there where you can still find pieces of coal that came out of that mine, if you want a souvenir. Um, so here's the town of Farmville up here. Here's 460, 15, and 45. Uh, right across the river, this is on, I think, the old Anderson place. There's a mine that's called the Jackson Mine. It was active in the 1880s. And then these two up here, uh, up north of the airport, are called the Piedmont Mines, and they were active also, uh, they were actually active in the 1860s, but these are the ones that were pumped out in the 1950s. And there are actually some pretty nice thick coal seams in those mines up there. Um, there's a little bit more about some of the other mining activity that has occurred in the county. Of course, probably a lot of you know about the Baker Mountain Kyanite plant. This was the first place in North America that kyanite was produced. This is out past Darlington Heights, out near um, well, Madisonville is right here. Darlington Heights is right over here. Prospect is actually, it's Pamplin. Prospect is up here. Um, Baker Mountain was producing kyanite in the 1920s. Now, kyanite, you know what kyanite is? It's a mineral, and it's, it's a very valuable industrial mineral. Mineral is used in making ceramic products and high temperature glassware and things like that. Um, so, the, the Kainite Mining Company still has uh, some operations out here, but the mine, they ceased mining in the 1980s, and the mine itself has been reclaimed. Um, up here, this is something that we just learned about fairly recently. There's a spot up here north of Prospect called the Prospect, Gold Prospect. And did you ever wonder where the name of the town Prospect came from? Well, I'm sorry? But they may have been prospecting for gold, but also this entire area out here, uh, a different Mr. Venable prospected for mica 
and um, feldspar in the 1940s. And we don't really know how much he produced, but he dug these holes all over western Prince Edward County. And you can still go to these places and find big sheets of mica. You know what mica is? It's a, it's a, a thin platy mineral and big chunks of feldspar, which is a, a white or pink mineral that forms kind of blocky shapes. And they were both strategic minerals back in the 1940s. Um, the mica was used, well, another name for mica, industrial name for mica is isinglass, so it was used in windows for stoves and, and uh, had some applications in the manufacture of vacuum tubes. And feldspar was also an ingredient in um, glassware and ceramics. So, um, with this up here is a, a pretty deep pit in the ground, and we think it was originally begun as an iron mine, possibly way back in the early 1800s and the 1830s, and then in the 1850s, someone discovered that the rocks there actually had gold in them, but we have no indication of how much gold was ever produced there. But as far as we know, that's the only um, known gold occurrence in Prince Edward County. And the gold is microscopic, you can't even see it. It's, it's very thinly disseminated in the rocks. Uh, what area of Prospect is that in? It's actually north of the town of Prospect, about five miles. Um, I forget the name of the road. I, if you talk to me afterwards, I can send you a detailed location. Actually, no, I can show you a detailed location tonight. I've got it in a map in the back. Yeah, around Featherfin Farm. Sorry? Yeah, around Featherfin Farm. Mm -hmm. We can look at the map. I don't know the, any of the local names of places around here. We're just up the road from the Empire Center to Fabricant. There's some coal mining operations. Okay, well, maybe. Uh, for, uh, from where was the name of the place? Better Fin Farm. Better Fin Farm. It was Route 625. Okay. Uh, are there any questions about this? This big fault that I was telling you about runs right actually down the east side of here and right actually. Crosses 460 a little bit west of downtown here, and then runs right down through the middle of the Piedmont. All right, okay, you can put that one down. Um, I have some other maps up here that you can look at afterwards. I just want to show you this one more thing. This is the uh, at Virginia Tech. There's a seismological <laughs> observatory, a group of people who actually record the occurrence of earthquakes in the eastern United States, and they keep all this information in a database, and they've gone way back into the 1800s and, and gleaned all the historical accounts of earthquakes <coughs> in Virginia, actually the Holy East Coast, and they put together this picture of earthquakes in eastern North America. So actually, I plotted this map from their database, and there's this whole area here called the Central Virginia Seismic Zone. All these earthquakes clustered in central Virginia. And Farmville is right down here. And it looks like two dots here, but these two dots actually represent three historic earthquakes in this area. There was one that we know of in the 1850s. And I have two notes on here. There was another one here in the 1950s, I think. Let's see. 1955. So there's one. 1850 in uh, October, then one in January of 1955, and then the last recorded earthquake we have in this area is the Great Farmville earthquake of October 21st, 1998, that woke us all up at 2 o'clock in the morning. I was, I was thrilled because it's the, the first and only earthquake I've ever felt myself, and we probably, probably all have stories about it, but um, I was sound asleep in bed, and it, it, it shook my house. I live way up here in Buckingham County. Let's see, I live about here. And uh, it almost literally shook me out of bed. And I, I jumped out of bed and I said, wow, that's an earthquake. And I ran out of the house and, and you could still hear it rolling across the landscape. It was, it was really neat. What was the day again? It was October 21st at 2 o'clock in the morning of 1998. Almost exactly two o'clock in the morning, or just a few within just a few minutes of two o'clock. I in think morning. I slipped through I that. that. I, I, <laughs> I, I it was three point four, I think, on the Richter scale. Three point four is a moderate-sized earthquake. Did anyone observe any damage to any objects or lose any valuable china or plates during that earthquake? Yes. What's the cracks in the science building? Really, at Longwood? 
they still there? Yeah. I'd like to take a picture of those, just for the record. Mm -hmm. We used to write down the dates, but the dates have gotten too good at wiping it all off. So. <laughs> the dates of the cracks? The cracks over 30 years. The cracks have gotten noticeably longer. It's almost in the floor now. Wow. And did it noticeably grow during that earthquake? Well, that's neat. Um, did anyone else have any damage during that event? Yes? Cracked plaster in your house? And where do you live? On High Street. Wow. Was it on the first floor or second floor? First floor. Wow, oh, that's interesting. Okay, well, um, I've been up here for almost 45 minutes. Uh, the handouts are pretty much self-explanatory. The first page of the handout is essentially that first map I chose. You can put that down. Thank you very much. Um, the second two pages of the handout are a little write-up by a colleague of mine. Uh, in recent years, we've done this for each county of Virginia, just a little bit about the mining history of the area. And then the fourth and third page are references, um, basically where the information in this report came from. And it starts out by saying, no mineral production was reported in 1997, but this was written in 1998. And we're looking at the most current year. And then the very last page, this hold out thing Otherwise, I've never really done that. <laughs> is a very simplified <laughs> geologic map of Virginia. So this is, this is how geologists see Virginia. When we look at the state, we see it like this in brilliant living color. Uh, but this is very similar to that first map I showed you showing the different belts uh, and the different geologic terrains in Virginia. Um, and a little bit ex of explanation as to what each one of those are and the different minerals that can be found in each one. Okay, um, I'd be happy to entertain any questions. I hope I haven't. Yes? On the last map, the, uh, the map showing the earthquakes, it looked like some correlation between the, earth the earthquakes here in the central Piedmont and the location of the James River. Is the James? This is really interesting, I, and you're not the first person who's noticed that, but you're right, the Central Virginia Seismic Zone, uh, and you can look at this map up here when we're done, it clusters around the James River, and specifically, it's where, it seems to be where the James River crosses a couple of these major faults in the Piedmont. And there's an interesting phenomenon, when they build a new water reservoir, it always causes seismicity. In other words, when you raise the water table of an area, it, for the first few months after a new reservoir is filled, the ground around it takes a while to adjust to that new hydrologic regime, and you get some shaking. And it's a measurable phenomenon. So it's possible the same thing is occurring along the James River. As that river flows through the Piedmont, water is leaking along these faults and causing some kind of activity, motion. Lubricates the fault uh, zones? Possibly. That's, that would be one explanation. We have no scientific basis for saying that. We're just deducing. Well, that would track to the Farmville problem, too, wouldn't it? Because well, we've Appomattox got the Appomattox River, and pretty much those two dots, that are actually three dots, are right where the Appomattox River crosses that fault. It, it's exactly right there. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I live about five miles below Worship Hall 15. Yeah. And uh, I have these large clusters of round boulders all over my property. Yeah. Of them. Right. yeah. I see it down in Charlotte County, too. Right. I thought they were Indian graves at first, but they're obviously not. Well, what is that phenomenon? How did this happen? <laughs> Um, you're not the first that's thought of those as Indian graves. It turns out that a couple of Longwood college students did a big project on rocks just like that over on the Anderson farm, and they worked for months on it, and I had to break the news to them that they, it was a completely natural phenomenon, that those rocks form all by themselves without any help from the Indians. That's a, a it's actually a volcanic rock called diabase that is of Jurassic age, as in Jurassic Park, um, those rocks formed in what we call dikes when the 
eastern part of Virginia, and I've skipped a whole lot of geologic history here, but, okay, I'll just do it with my hands. <laughs> During the time these basins were forming, as we have here in North of Farmville and here at Briary Creek, this continent was actually part of the supercontinent Pangaea. You might have heard about that on the Discovery Channel when all the continents were together about 200 million years ago. All the continents were together in one big continent. So there was no Atlantic Ocean here. There was a mountain range here. And when that continent began to come apart and the Atlantic Ocean began to open, when Africa and Europe began drifting away from Eastern North America, did you know that happened? <laughs> uh, the Atlantic started as a very narrow ocean and began widening. But the cracks that formed at that time, um, well, let me back up a little bit. Before a continent can pull apart, the, the crust becomes thin. The crust of the Earth becomes thin. And then it begins to crack. And the mantle, which is sort of semi-molten material just beneath the crust, literally oozes up into some of those cracks. And that's what those rocks are. They didn't begin round. They began almost as walls of solid black rock injected into um, lighter colored rock of the ancient North American crust. These are younger rocks that came in as molten magma and filled these fractures. All right? So it's a black volcanic rock that formed these big vertical bodies. Then, the elements, weather, eroded us down to the surface that we live on today. The rock is very, very uniform throughout. So um, it's exactly the opposite of slate. Now slate breaks into very flat plates because slate is not uniform throughout. The mineral grains are aligned very closely like this. And so it breaks along the surfaces. This diabase is completely unlike that. But the mineral grains are interlocking at all different angles, so when it weathers, it weathers with no flat surfaces at all. It weathers into round shapes. So what you're seeing are the weathered remnants, literally boulders, that formed from this big volcanic rock mass. And we can trace those things. They form on our geologic maps. I've got this big geologic map of Virginia here. Those things appear as north-south running red stripes on this map. And we can come up and see them. And there are some very, there's a very large one that passes, um, actually it passes just west of here, just, I mean just a few feet west of here. And it's about 100 feet wide and it crosses the river and then it goes down into Charlotte County. And actually it goes all the way to North Carolina and goes all the way up to um, at least from Atlantic County. I'm sorry? Yeah, they're black. Well, they're, they're actually brown or orange on the outside, but if you can manage to crack one open, they're a blackish blue on the inside. It's a very hard rock. They're almost impossible to break. Most of that's a
dim light, but if you get the sun on it just right, you can see about quarter inch long crystals in there. Basalt is almost always microscopic crystals, very, very, very fine. But it's the same, same stuff. Yes, ma'am. Did you have a question? Did you? No? Okay. Sorry. Does the state uh, We have some pamphlets and we have maps. Um, I think I brought a catalog of our publications. You know what? I, think I did bring a catalog of our publications, but if you give me your name and address, I will make sure you get the catalog of our publications and I can send you some free pamphlets. And um, probably the best freebie we've got, or the most, with the most explanation on it, is this, this thing right here. There's a lot of information on here, including a little bit about these dye based dikes. There are these red things here, and they're shown as these red stripes coming through. They cut across everything else. Mm -hmm. You can go to um, www.geology.state.va.us, and that's our division's website. If you really want to know a lot about the geologic history of Virginia, the best I've seen is in William and Mary, wm.edu slash geology. So www.wm.edu slash geology has some really good stuff out there. Hi, Kate. Hi. <laughs> uh, there's so many geological zones in Virginia. How does Virginia uh, rate as far as interest <laughs> extremely. Extre well, say compared to Kansas. Extremely. <laughs> um, there are some states that have probably a greater variety of geology than we do, maybe California, but we're, for geologists, this is a really good state to be. We have very, very old rocks here. The rocks of the Blue Ridge Mountains are over a billion years old. And we have everything from, you know, it's a very, very young rocks. So, um, yes, we have a great variety here, and being at the edge of the continent really helps, because we're like the dented fender of the continent, where all these other continents have left their bumpers sort of attached to us, and so we have a great variety of different rock types here. And we're, we're lucky in that we have uh, really a vast mineral wealth here. We're the eighth largest coal producing state in the nation. A lot of people don't realize that, but it's over a billion dollar a year industry, just the coal in Virginia. The other mineral commodities produced in Virginia have an aggregate value of about a billion dollars. So the total mineral production of Virginia is about two billion dollars a year. It's a significant slice of the economy. What are we looking for now? What are geologists looking for primarily now? I tell you, a lot of our business is environmental. We help a lot of people with water wells, uh, septic fields. We help munis municipalities find municipal water supplies. Um, a lot of our business deals with abandoned mines, too. Public safety issues around abandoned mines. Um, but in terms of resources, um, as I said, there's a big natural gas play going on right now in southwestern Virginia. Uh, Virginia also has at least one very rich uranium deposit but it was legislated out of existence back in the 70s. Um, there was a company, Marline Uranium, was already come in here and mined this big uranium deposit down toward Martinsville. And um, the state said, no, we don't want uranium mining in Virginia. So they just regulated it out of possibility, really. Mm. Yes, sir. 10 or 15 years ago, there was a big flurry of interest in titanium and the border between Virginia and North Carolina and mm -hmm. South of here. Mm -hmm. Is that still in operation? Or did that it operation? is, as a matter of fact. And that's, I, I have to sort of pat ourselves on the back. That was one of the big success stories of our state agency is that it was one of our geologists that literally discovered that deposit. And he wrote a paper about it. And the paper just happened to be read by the right person in Australia. And so this company, RGC Resources, came here and began developing this mine down in, it's on the border between Dinwiddie and Surrey? Surrey. Sorry? It's in Dinwiddie, but there's a new uh, prospect that they're looking at in Dinwiddie branch. This is a colleague of mine, Damien Ferrer. He's actually a mine inspector who lives in Farmville. Thank you. 
It, it, that itself is a multi-million dollar operation. I don't exactly know what their production is, but they are producing, uh, they're actually beach sands, ancient beach sands, probably two or three million years old, that contain, you know, when you go down to the beach, not all the sand is white. If you pick up the, the sand in your hand, you'll notice there are little black specks in there. And all those little black specks are titanium-bearing minerals. And it takes special conditions to produce a very concentrated deposit, and that's what we have in that spot in Dinwiddie County. Uh,
I can't say we understand everything about them, but we have a general idea of what they are and where they are. And the reason those rocks are there is just because the river happens to be flowing over them, just washing all the dirt away. But it is a relatively resistant rock. It doesn't erode easily, and that's why those waterfalls are there. Okay, I will, it's now um, five after eight. I'm, I'll stick around for as long as you want to talk, but I've got maps to show, and if you didn't get a handout, I've got a few more up here. I actually have some extras, if any of you are um, school teachers, or if you would just like some extras of this colored map in the back, I have extras of these. And uh, I've got a few of our publications over here, a couple of articles about the Farmville area and the mineral resources in the Farmville area. An excellent article on the Lithia Springs by Bob Flippin that we published about, what, 20 years ago? May of 1983. 1983, almost 20 years ago. And um, some other interesting things on the table that you might like to see.
this much business, but I, we have some guests and we have some, uh, we have a lot of our regular members. But we're going to continue to try to gather up family histories, and we have recently uh, been donated a computer, an up-to-date computer, and we're going to enter a database system, and we're going to do all local family histories that we can gather up, and we're going to uh, continue our senatorial project. And last year we began a bibliography.